Welcome to Relentless Truth with John Warren, the podcast that extracts truth from a wide range of topics, revealing who God is, who we are, and how we relate to each other. Now, here's John with this week's powerful and practical insights. Welcome to Relentless Truth. I'm John Warren. It's good to be with you. Please like, share, review, and subscribe to Relentless Truth to this podcast. And for more information about our work, go to johnwarrenmedia.com. Our guest today is a very special guest, my good friend, Hank Hanegraaff. Hank is president and chairman of the board of the North Carolina-based Christian Research Institute. He's also host of the nationally syndicated Bible Answer Man broadcast, as well as the Hank Unplugged podcast. He's widely regarded as one of the world's leading Christian authors and apologists. Through his live call-in radio broadcast, Hank equips Christians to mine the Bible for all its wealth and answers questions on the basis of careful research and sound reasoning. And through the Hank Unplugged podcast, he interviews today's most significant Christian leaders, apologists, and thinkers. He's the author of more than 20 books with more than a million copies in print, and 2019 saw the release of his book, Truth Matters, Life Matters More, The Unexpected Beauty of an Authentic Christian Life. He's a regular contributor to the award-winning Christian Research Journal and an articulate communicator on the pressing issues of our day. Having spoken in leading churches, conferences, and on college campuses throughout the world, Hank and his wife, Kathy, live in Charlotte, North Carolina, and their parents to 12 children. Hank, welcome. Thank you, John. Appreciate that long and uh, very kind introduction. Well, I, I didn't think the man, the myth, the legend would be would be enough. <laughs> well, I really do appreciate you being here, and I... You know, as well known as you are for uh, the Bible Answer Man broadcast, and I and I should say that you know my wife and I listened to, as you know, your broadcast thirty uh, some years ago, and would drive home from work from she from the hospital, me from the bank, and would compare notes, and that was part of a process that uh, where God began to work in in our lives to. Uh, to get us to probe more deeply, and and it's amazing how we would we would say, "Can you believe that guy from California said this today?" But I, I know you're well known for for that, for your books that you've written and other aspects of your work. But I think our listeners would enjoy getting to know you a bit, and I'm wondering if you would start by just kind of giving us an overview of the life of Hank Hanegraaff, if you would. Yeah, I can do that. First of all, let me say that I love the. Uh the name of your podcast, Relentless Truth. I mean, we live in a post-truth culture, a culture in which truth is so obscure and falsehood so established that unless you love the truth, you cannot know it. Mm, so to right. have a podcast that is committed to relentless truth, to to exploding the mythology that envelops so much of our culture and is leading to the demise of Western civilization, I think, is transcendently important. In terms of my own life, I was born in the Netherlands, so I'm Dutch. Dutch is my first language. We immigrated when I was three to Canada, and then when I was 14 to the United States. And I, I suppose most of my early life, as I think back on it, is characterized by questions. I was constantly asking questions. And one of the things I remember, John, the most is not receiving satisfactory answers to my questions. Mm. And as a result of that, I actually walked away from the Christian faith. I grew up in the Christian faith. I walked away from the Christian faith. And for all intents and purposes, I became a practical atheist. Uh, not an atheist in the truest sense of the word, but a practical atheist, someone who was practicing uh, the tenets of atheism, who was living as though there is no God. Mm. Hank, let, and, me, let me ask you this, because in, in my experience with high school young people, we encountered this and we're concerned about that. I didn't remember that about your story, but roughly what age were you when you went through that period? Well, it started when I was age 14. Ah, uh, yeah. 
Yeah, so that was in 1964. And, you know, there's so many things that were happening at that time. You know, you had the, around that period of time, you had the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Uh, you had the Beatles who were questioning their Christian faith. And all of that led to questions that I would ask my teachers, my pastor, and my parents. And when I didn't get satisfactory answers, my assumption was there are no satisfactory answers. And that led me to uh, leaving the Christian faith for quite a long period of time, actually until I was 29. And when I was 29 years of age, three people who had intended to knock on my neighbor's door knocked on my door. And uh, they, in a sort of a, a halting, stumbling fashion, began to communicate the gospel to me. Well, I'd come out of a Christian background, so I'd ask them questions that would stump them. And they, in a very modest way, just said, look, uh, we, we don't know the answer to that question, but we, we are having a seminar at our church next Saturday on the issue of origin." And um, anyway, I ended up going to that seminar, and that started my trek back into Christianity, because what I say now, John, and I'm sure you've heard me say this many times, how one views their origins ultimately will determine how they live their life. If you believe that you're a function of random chance, that you arose from the primordial slime, you're going to live your life by a different standard than if you know you're created in the image of God and thus accountable to him. That's exactly right. So this matter of origin has become for me the foundational issue on which all of truth rests, the fact that God created the universe. And this is a self-evident truth. In other words, if you look at the Old Testament, King David, the quintessential king of Israel, said that the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech, night after night they proclaim knowledge. There's no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their words go out to the ends of the earth. In other words, if you look at the night sky, you know there has to be a creator. Design presupposes a designer. That's right. But the Apostle Paul in the New Testament said much the same. He said, God's eternal power, divine nature, clearly seen through what has been made so that men are without excuse. So we have the light of creation, and we can either suppress that light in unrighteousness or we can we can submit our lives to it and then find true joy and happiness. Mm, that's right. That's exactly right. Well, and tell me from there, Hank, what, how did you, how, how did, I don't know the genesis of your ministry and I know it's multifaceted and that's a, that requires a long answer, but, but from, from that point in your life, what, what, what transpired to, prompt you to employ yourself in this in this apologetics work that you do so well? Yeah, well, one of the first things that I did as a new Christian is I, I learned how to communicate the gospel, and I, I learned that through a program at a Presbyterian church, Coral Ridge Presbyterian in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, yep. which was right, I, I lived right on the staple, actually, of the church, and so I went to that church, and that's where I heard that, that message on origins as well, where it was actually sort of a a debate. But I, in that process of learning to share my faith, learned it not just academically, but experientially. Because in the program that was popular at that time called Evangelism Explosion, you would not only learn in classroom, but you'd also go out in the highways and the byways, and you would take what you were learning, and you would put it into practice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so I, I, I found out through that process that people were really hungry for answers. Uh, eventually, uh, Walter Martin, who's the president of, and, and founder of the Christian Research Institute, uh, wanted me to take my, my prowess in memorization and apply that to learning how the cults deviated from the historic Christian faith, make that memorable for people. And uh, eventually, in spending a lot of time with him and working with him on projects, he asked me to become president of the Christian Research Institute, and not long after that, he died. So then there was not a whole lot of choice except to pick up the mantle and move forward. And, and approximately what year was that, roughly? Yeah, it was 1988. The end of 1988, beginning of 1989, that I became president of the Christian Research Institute. And, you know, one of the feature programs 
in ministry outreach for the Christian Research Institute is a, uh, a broadcast called the Bible Answer Man broadcast. And on that broadcast, you just answer people's questions. So uh, right. essentially, the, the phone lines light up and you, you answer people's questions. And, and that really was the stock and trade of the ministry in terms of a focal ministry outreach for almost 40 years, many years that Walter Martin did it. And then, you know, I've, I've done it over three decades myself. So uh, answering questions was essentially what my identity surrounded. It revolved around, I should say. It, it became a, what I was known for. And people always say, oh, you're the Bible Answer Man. I'd always say, no, I'm not the Bible Answer Man. I'm the host of a broadcast called the Bible Answer Man Broadcast. You know, it's so funny. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I had that in my notes because i it's the funniest thing. As I mention you and your work to friends, uh, if I, as I've done this over the years, one of the responses is, and, you, and you're, you're really well known, it's a rare person who doesn't know about this particular, the Bible Answer Man broadcast, they will say to me, oh, he's the Bible Answer Man. And, and since I've heard you socially correct, well, gently, people who do that, I, I've learned to I've learned to say, well, that's the name of the program, and and he is the guy who does answer the questions, but 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 he doesn't call himself the Bible answer man. Yeah, and the reason, John, is because you know the more you know, the more you realize how little you know in the full scope of what can be known. Isn't, and so isn't that the truth? Yeah, it's a daunting thing to be called the not a but the Bible answer man. <laughs> but that became my, my 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 handle. I mean, that that's what most people recognize me as, not as the president of the Christian Research Institute exactly. or the, the books, but rather the Bible Answer Man. Yep. Yep. Well, you know, I, I have to tell you, just, just hearing your story, I, you know, I flash back to late 80s, early 90s, driving along in my car and stuck on I-4 in Orlando in traffic. And I remember thinking, there's no way that guy answers the phone and and provides these answers. Now, I've I've had the the pleasure, the honor of being in your studio and watching this happen. And you really don't get a lot of, you don't get a lot of lead time there. And you're asked some really challenging questions. There's probably a pattern. You probably have a good idea of, of, of the, the pattern of, of the questions from Christians and non-Christians alike. But, but is it, is it those, it's got to be those memorization skills plus a deep, knowledge of scripture. And I talk to students all the time about the fact that it is the object of our faith, God himself, that that we must know well to walk out, to live out this this Christian life. And I'm I'm just wondering what would you say to to the typical Christian who who says, "Hey, I'm kind of in a a mile wide, inch deep environment. You know, I'm in a typical evangelical church." But how does a person begin to really experience growth and begin to learn the riches of, of the truth that you just referenced a few minutes ago? Yeah, I think one of the things that we have to recognize is that we're involved in a treasure chest. And that treasure chest has no bottom. But most people, uh, they don't come to the faith thinking about this being a treasure chest. Rather, they think about it in punctiliar fashion, meaning I prayed a prayer, and Jesus Christ is now my Savior. And I have a ticket in my hand that gets me into heaven and keeps me out of hell. And so then they live the remainder of their Christian lives as baptized secular humanists meaning they never really grow in the richness of the faith once we're all delivered to the saints. I think that the the answer, therefore, is not to see your faith as punctiliar as being a point or reference in time as much as it is a process. Mm. Because we were created not only as icons of God in the image of, and likeness of God, but we are created to become God-like, more and more like God, in life and nature, not in the Godhead. We'll never have identity of essence when it comes to God, but we are created to progress as, as human beings, not only in this life, but also in the life that is to come. So even after you die, 
it's not as though you have everything accomplished in terms of knowledge. Because if you think about it, John, God is ineffable, which is to say there's no end to coming to know God. Mm -hmm. We will always learn and grow and develop in our knowledge of God, albeit without error in eternity, but we will still grow in our knowledge of God. But even more than that, we will, I shouldn't say more than that, but, but, but like unto that, we will grow in our, our ability to absorb the riches of the universe that he has created. We think about this universe and we think, wow, this universe is big, but we have no real understanding of how big it truly is. We used to think that the universe maybe had billions of galaxies. Now we know it has trillions of galaxies with billions of stars. So we can never come to an end of what Paul talks about in Romans chapter 8. Never come to an end of exploring a recreated the universe, a universe that now groans and travail, but one day will be liberated from its bondage to decay. So my point is, is that the Christian life is a process, and we so often short-circuit the process by thinking about our faith as a point in time rather than a process that continues on throughout mm. eternity. Uh, so true. And, you know, you just described, Hank, my life and probably so many others where I grew up in an environment that I would, I would characterize as part of that kind of the multiplying movements, the, you know, revivalism, church planting, even that evangelism explosion period. Uh, I remember presentations by well-intended ministries like Campus Crusade and others. And I, I remember wondering as a young kid, 10, 11 years old, had, did I pray the right prayer? Did I use the right words? Did I have enough faith? How much faith was enough? And it, it was all based on this, this moment in time, and I, I did not understand the concepts that you just outlined. It was only as an adult. Um, I, I had a very similar period to yours, and I don't think you and I have ever talked about this, but I, I had a, a similar 20, 20 30-year period where I was probably, you'd probably consider me a practical atheist as well. So... I think this is something we don't talk about in the evangelical church very much, but I think a lot of the doubts, fears, and guilt that people are, that professing Christians are kind of running around with are, are, are due to this challenge that you just mentioned. I want to ask you about this. There, there's a concept of, uh, I, I want you to talk about the book in, in just a moment, but before we do that, there's this concept called Christian worldview, and we talked about it a lot. Last time I was in Charlotte, we talked about it. We talked about absolute truth and and how we're you had just had a guest on the week before that talked about the fact that we are in a post truth world and I certainly agree with that sometimes we call it post modernism or now it's sort of post post modernism and there's this notion that that um, good ministries like summit and others uh, Jeff Myers and a, a lot of folks a lot of apologetics ministries kind of teach this this notion that you know, we kind of weigh Christianity and other worldviews, and Christianity wins when we examine the evidence. And what we need to teach students, young people, young Christians to do is to take off the flawed lenses that they see the world through and put on new lenses, Christian lenses that will allow you then to see the world from this Christian perspective. The Christian experience, the Christian life is so much more than that. Can you just touch on that for a moment? Yeah, the first thing I'd like to comment on is, is your bringing up the, the, the phrase post-truth, the hyphenated word post-truth. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, that actually was Oxford Dictionary's 2016 Word of the Year, and it does capture the culture's current mood and preoccupation. Uh, the idea is that objective facts have become less influential in shaping public policy and so now, what has become more influential is appeals to subjective fabrications. And those are rationalized in our culture. Uh, so, for example, Oliver Stone, the famed filmmaker, mm -hmm. uh, talked about truth when he was caught in a fabrication 
a really big fabrication. And his rationalization was, okay, I admit it wasn't true. It was false. But I was defining evil with a capital E. So therefore, my fabrication is justified because it supports a larger truth. So in a post-truth culture, it is so important to recognize that Jesus Christ declared himself to be the way, the truth, and the light. So he is the way to the Father, the Father being the embodiment of truth. And that's why Jesus can tell us that truth is central to our Christian lives. It's why the Apostle Paul can tell us to put on the full armor of God, the first piece of which is the belt of truth. When that belt breaks, the covering that protects us against the world, the flesh, and the devil simply crumples to the ground and leaves us naked and vulnerable. So Mm. it's important for us as Christians to have a handle on what truth is, that it is an aspect of the nature of God himself, that truth is anything that corresponds to reality, that truth is essential to a Christian worldview, or as Alexander Zolzhenitsyn once said, that one word of truth outweighs the entire world. So we have to put a premium on truth because as Christians, we are the bearers of truth. We are the arbiters of truth. We are the leavening force in a culture that is post-truth. And the only way that that culture ultimately changes is by Christians communicating truth in the right way. Not truth because it works. That's pragmatism. Mm -hmm. Not truth because it feels right. That's subjectivism. Not truth because it's my truth. That's relativism. But truth because it is anchored in a Christian worldview that says God created the universe, Jesus Christ is God, and that the Bible is the truth. Jesus said in the high priestly prayer, John 17, he said, sanctify them to your truth, thy word is true. So I think to have a realistic worldview, uh, we have to be steeped in truth, which means to be steeped in Christ, who is the personification of truth. Which also means to know scripture and to know it uh, deeply. And that's that's really what your ministry was used by God to prompt in our lives. It prompted a much deeper study. Thank you for joining us today. We will be back next week with part two of our conversation with Hank Hanegraaff. Thanks for listening to Relentless Truth with John Warren. Please consider sharing this podcast and subscribe to receive future episodes. Connect with John regarding your comments, questions, and show ideas through johnwarrenmedia.com or at John Warren Media on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. That's all for this episode. Join us next week for another edition of Relentless Truth with John Warren.